Hi, and welcome to my third devlog episode. In this episode, I will show you how I modified my existing soft body implementation, which used distance constraints and a global volume constraint, to a more rigid version you can see here. My next goal is to simulate a tire for which this was not enough. The shape of the model here is somewhat retained, but more like a strange balloon. Unlike a balloon, a tire has much thicker walls and is harder to bend. Naturally, my first attempt was to implement bending constraints. So let's jump right into it. The general idea is to retain the angles of all edges that are shared by two triangles. As an example, let's look at these two triangles here. They are defined by four points. P0 and P1 which define the shared edge, P2 for the left triangle and P3 for the right triangle. As you can see, the triangle surfaces are connected at a certain angle phi. Just like for the distances and the volume, to keep this angle at its initial angle, we define a constraint Cj whose value is the difference of the current angle phi from its initial angle phi 0. Because if Cj becomes 0, then phi equals phi 0. Computing the angles can be done using the dot product. For any two vectors a and b, where the smaller angle between them is named phi, the dot product can be defined like this. It is equal to the length of a and b and the cosine of phi multiplied. After rearranging the equation, we can now compute phi. But which vectors should be used for the two triangles? For this I followed the original position-based dynamics paper, where they used the triangle normal vectors. I named them nl and nr, referencing the left and right triangles. They can be computed with the three edge vectors EL of the left triangle, EM of the shared middle edge and ER of the right triangle by using the cross product like this. Dividing the products by their lengths ensures that the normal vectors are actually normalized. Phi can now be inserted into CJ to get its final form. As you might already be familiar with by now, to solve the constraint, the expression needs to be derived with respect to the four positions P0, P1, P2 and P3 that are contained in X. To start, we need to apply the chain rule to the Arcos function. This results in a derivative of the Arcos function evaluated at the original argument, being multiplied with the derivative of the argument. In our example, f of x corresponds to this expression. As a shortcut, I use the cosine of phi as the argument. To avoid taking all the fun out of it, I'll leave the steps of the derivation as an exercise for you. On your way, you might find these formulas useful. If you didn't make an error and I didn't make an error, you could end up with this as the derivative of the argument cosine of phi. It's quite a long expression, but by replacing these terms with the corresponding normal vectors, these products with the cosine of phi and the vector x by the four relevant points and doing some further simplifications, the final derivatives are obtained. Interestingly, because p0 is contained in all edge vectors but negative, its derivative is the negated sum of the other derivatives. Let's have a look at my implementation. This function solves a single bending constraint, which means it needs to be called for each edge of the model. It takes the four positions x0, x1, x2 and x3 as pointers, their inverse masses w0, w1, w2 and w3, the initial angle phi0 and again a lambda variable and a stiffness variable alpha. The four position pointers correspond to the four positions p0, p1, p2 and p3 in the constraint function. In addition, the three edge vectors EM, EL and ER and the normal vectors NL and NR with their respective lengths LL and LR are defined. If any of the two lengths is zero, its corresponding triangle is degenerate and an angle can be computed. So the function returns in this case. Otherwise, the normal vectors are normalized and the dot product formula is used to first compute the cosine of the angle and then the actual angle. The clamp norm dot function is used here to clamp the value of the dot product into the range minus 1 to 1 because if the Arcos argument is just slightly out of bounds, the result will be none, which is never good in a simulation. Using phi, the constraint value cj is computed next and checked for being zero. In that case, the constraint is satisfied and it doesn't need to be solved. To compute the derivative vectors, the factor from the Arcos derivative is needed, so its denominator is defined first. And because it is a denominator, there is another zero check. 
When passed, the derivative vectors can be computed. Using these, the extended position-based dynamics formulas are applied by first defining the denominator of the delta lambda variable and again checking for zero, then computing delta lambda and updating the triangle positions. Finally, the lambda variable is updated. Now let's see if the implementation works. The bunny here currently has distance and volume constraints. As soon as I enable the new bending constraints, it explodes, which is not a good sign. I did a little bit of thinking, checked the formulas and thought maybe it has to do something with floating point inaccuracy. Particularly, the division by this denominator can actually be completely removed just by making the code a little bit less understandable. First, it is factored out of the derivative vectors here and here. To make the code fit onto the screen later, the denominator can now be moved down. Further, it is possible to factor the denominator out here by multiplying alpha with the inverse like this. Now, when moving the denominator out of the delta lambda denominator, it multiplies with delta lambda because of the double division. This factor here really wants to cancel these denominators, so delta lambda is redefined to make it possible. After cancelling, the denominator division is completely removed, so the zero check is not needed anymore. To arrive at the final implementation, the square of the denominator is replaced by its radicand. Alright, let's see if it works now. It didn't do anything really. Starting the simulation with bending constraints directly doesn't help either. However, it doesn't explode using softer bending constraints. Though the bunny doesn't seem to like its new constraints. It shivers like it's cold and also has some crazy storage problems. After spending some time experimenting and checking the formulas, I could even turn its head into a fuzzy enemy. At some point I saw this, which led me to remember something. This is the graph of the cosine function and this is the one of the arcus function. The angle phi of our two triangles is what we want to compute. However, using the dot product we only get the cosine of phi, which is then reversed to obtain phi. For an original angle smaller than pi this works fine, but as soon as the angle exceeds pi you can see the reconstructed angle reverses and differs from the original angle. This is because the arcus function only returns half the angle range. So in this shot here you can see that the bottom side of the bunny is soft in the wrong direction. The initial model looks like this. The angles are flipped. To verify my hypothesis, I built this test setup. Here the two triangles connect at the angle phi and show the state before the solve function is applied. Phi zero is the angle the function will try to solve for. Currently phi and phi zero are equal, so cj is zero and there is nothing to solve. Once I change the angle phi, you can see a lighter pair of triangles, which show the result of the solve step. For angles smaller than pi it works fine, but as soon as I go beyond pi the result flips which is very bad, especially when the solution is near pi. To fix this we can subtract the reconstructed angle from 2 pi if the original angle exceeds pi like you can see here. However since the original angle is what we are trying to compute, how is this gonna help us? Well there is sort of a trick that just lets us know if phi is greater than pi without computing phi. And of course it's about the cross product again. Here phi is smaller than pi. The cross product of the two normal vectors points in the same direction as the shared edge vector. For a setup where phi is greater than pi, the cross product between the normal vectors now points in the opposite direction. Using this, the constraint can be reformulated. If the dot product between the normal vector cross product and the edge vector is negative, they point in opposite directions, so the angle is flipped. Else the original formula is used. This is one of the reasons extended position based dynamics is so powerful. Constraints don't have to be formulated using a single expression. They can support different cases. Since 2 pi and phi are just constants, the only thing that changes for the derivative is that in the flipped case the derivative becomes negative. I implemented this change by replacing Arcros with a custom function that handles the two constraint cases. In addition to that, it also outputs the sign of the Arcros function used, such that it can be used for the derivative here. With this fix, you can see that the solver result doesn't flip directions anymore when crossing pi. And the bunny is happier too.
until the deformation gets too large. Even after some more formula checking and thinking, I couldn't come up with the solution to this problem. It looks nice for some time, but I didn't want to risk anything to explode while playing the game. So at this point I moved on to a different technique. But I just want to mention, later I learned it's actually possible to implement bending constraints using distance constraints, which might be more stable. For example, if the two opposing triangle points are connected with the distance constraint, it will act kind of like a bending constraint. Because the triangle edge lengths are constrained, the only way for the opposing point distance constraint to be satisfied is at the original angle. Though just like for the original bending constraint, this method also allows the flip triangles to be a valid solution. Still, if you ever try it out, let me know how it went. I think the reason why the flipping problem is disregarded in the papers is because bending constraints were originally designed for cloth simulation, where the default state is completely flat, meaning there is no flip solution, completely eliminating the problem. Even before I had finished implementing bending constraints, I discovered this video, where Matthias Müller explains how to use tetrahedral meshes for soft body simulations. Contrary to regular models that are made up of surface triangles, tetrahedral meshes are made up of tetrahedrons. So in addition to the points on their surface, they also have inner points. At first I didn't understand why you would do that, but I guess it makes sense because real world objects also have mass inside of them. And after seeing the Stanford bunny being terminated, I thought to give it a try. However the first question that comes up is how do you even obtain tetrahedral meshes? Luckily, in this follow-up video, he explains how tetrahedral meshes can be generated from surface meshes. He explains an algorithm called Delaunay triangulation, which sounded way too complicated for me to implement, so I just used the Blender plugin he created. After downloading and installing the plugin, you get an additional Shift A option that creates a tetrahedralized version of the selected mesh. Here, each tetrahedron is modeled and there are small gaps which allows better visualizations. For actual usage you need to uncheck this box. Then the gaps are removed and it looks really weird because each tetrahedron is modeled by a quad. So now I had to change my OBJ parser to support quad loading and also wrote a bunch of terrible code to extract surface triangles and edges from the quad mesh. For example to check if one side of a tetrahedron is part of the mesh surface I check if any other tetrahedron shares this side. I didn't really care about the efficiency of this code, since this was just meant to be for the asset creation. There was only one small problem though. These triangles were supposed to be surface triangles. It turns out the generated mesh has some misaligned tetrahedrons inside of them, so checking for exact neighboring triangles didn't entirely work. I am not sure if this is a bug in the Blender plugin or if there is just no way to make all tetrahedrons connect perfectly, but I wanted to fix it. After a couple of painful hours and more terrible code, I detected these faulty surface triangles and it worked. When simulating, the bunny preserves its shape pretty well, even when just using distance constraints. This is of course because of the inner points that stabilize the surface. However, if the deformation is a bit stronger, the original shape gets lost because the edges just rotate in some other direction. It's even possible to squish parts of the bunny like this. To prevent these things from happening, a local volume constraint can be applied to each tetrahedron. These constraints are similar to the one I used last episode, but much simpler because each tetrahedron has a fixed number of points. As you can see, for tetrahedral meshes, distance and volume constraints are enough to get similar results to the surface mesh with bending constraints. Except this one doesn't explode of course. When only the local volume constraints are enabled, you get this melting effect. Probably not of much use, but I thought it looks pretty cool. Now before you go through the same pain I did trying to load and fix the tetrahedral mesh from the Blender plugin, if you can I would encourage you to wait for my next episode where I show you another tool that does the same job called TetGen. I switched because for my tire model I had even more problems using the Blender plugin. Besides that, I promise this is the last episode where I will just tell you that I want to create a tire. In the next episode I will show you how I did it. I will end this video with a small spoiler if you want to see it. Thanks for watching.